Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to the Center for Policy Research. Uh, very happy to have you uh, here with us today. As you know, CPR has been running this uh, series on uh, air pollution, um, which is called Clearing the Air with a question mark at the end of it, uh, very deliberately. And the objective of the series is really to inform ourselves and the broader community about issues around air pollution uh, in the capital, but also more generally about air pollution in, in all of uh, northern India. We've had uh, events looking at health issues, the data, transport, power plants, and so on and so forth. And today we're going to be covering uh, the important topic of, of dust and the role of dust uh, in contributing to, to Delhi's uh, air pollution. Now, uh, as you've seen, it's, it's rained uh, today, which is, of course, very good news from a dust point of view. It's less good news from the point of view of getting people to come to seminars. Uh, which is sort of in Delhi, there's always, you know, you, what you get with one hand is taken away with the other. Uh, but we might have more people kind of filtering in uh, as, the, as the afternoon goes on who've been stuck in traffic jams in various parts of the city. So as we try and do at these seminars, uh, we're going to have uh, some very, very uh, experienced and learned uh, people along to help us understand this topic. Uh, we're going to try and make this as discursive as possible. Uh, and um, I'm going to start by introducing uh, all three panelists. Uh, and then open it up uh, uh, to each of the panelists to give their, their presentation. So let me, let me start first by introducing our, our, our panelists, and we're very, very grateful to them uh, for, for joining us today. Uh, first will be uh, Dr. Umesh uh, Kulshrestha, who's a professor at the School of Environmental Studies, uh, Environmental Sciences, rather, at JNU in New Delhi. So welcome, sir. Uh, professor Kulshrestha, uh, his research interests include dust aerosol chemistry, uh, and gaseous nitrogen pollution with a special focus on atmospheric and environmental implications of poor air quality. Uh, he has been uh, a number of, uh, has a number of responsibilities over the years, including Deputy Director of the South Asia Nitrogen Center, a fellow at the Indian Geophysical Union, uh, and a review editor for the WMO UNEP Integrated Assessment Report on Black Carbon and Ozone, as well as involved in the IPCC's fifth assessment report. So, Dr. Kulshrestha is eminently qualified to, to sort of lead us through some of the science, uh, and we're very grateful to you for taking the time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, after Dr. Kulshrestha, Dr. Anuradha Shukla will speak. Uh, Dr. Shukla is the chief scientist at the Central Road Research Institute um, and has more than 30 years' knowledge of experience and knowledge on urban emissions, particles, and transportation. She has looked at the health impacts of suspended particulate matter, uh, and the measurement and characterization of urban dust. Um, she also serves on the expert appraisal committee led by MOEFCC and in the past has received the prestigious Fulbright Nehru Environmental uh, Leadership uh, uh, Program. So uh, we're very glad to have you with us to, to talk about, in particular, uh, the road dust side of things. Um, third, and by no means least, we have Mr. Sunil Agarwal uh, with us who is the founder and managing director of Black Olive Ventures, a real estate valuation and, and advisory company. We thought it was very important uh, to try and get a stakeholder view uh, from the construction industry, and we're very grateful to you uh, for accepting the invitation. Uh, Mr. Agarwal has 23 years of experience in the real estate sector, uh, including with uh, as the CEO of South Asian Real Estate, uh, a private equity back, uh, fund-backed real estate uh, venture, uh, and he served uh, at senior positions at HSBC, uh, the School of Real Estate, and so on and so forth. He's also served as a member of the Board of Studies of the School of Planning and Architecture, Delhi, and of uh, SEPT uh, in Ahmedabad. So I think you're very familiar with speaking to diverse audiences, uh, so which I, and I hope we can, we can push the boundaries of that uh, in our conversation here today. So with that, uh, let me first turn to uh, Professor Kulshesta, who's going to give us a, a 15 minute or so presentation to introduce the topic. Your slides are set up. Okay. First of all, I thank CPR uh, to invite me and uh, to allow me to share my work related to research. I have been involved in uh, aerosol and 
atmospheric dust research for last three decades almost we have a lot of, we have done a lot of work on research related atmospheric constituents nature of dust chemistry of dust role of dust in maintaining various levels of gas and particulates involvement in various processes i am very happy to basically i wanted to communicate with such kind of gathering about dust and this is the right time and uh, right group where i want to share something because when you do some work as a researcher then you need to translate into policy matter by doing only research it's not very appreciated because that is only you publish and finished if you research it recognize discuss and utilize for policy then only it is worth so this is something i felt very happy when i got this invitation because cpr is already well known one of my student disha was working here so from that angle probably i got this right opportunity to share this let me start something i will not uh, go into detail because 15 minute i will follow 15 minute but i will highlight uh, the points which are of your use just to convey what is the gist of that <clears throat> if you see this slide basically this is something just to realize you many of you may not be knowing is it really so important because when you read environmental or atmospheric research papers available in standard journal not much research reported for dust and atmospheric dust is rule because dust is not the concern of the advanced country because they don't have dust so the work is not done so i took this on priority because the dust is our problem dust is something which is abundant in the atmospheric laboratory so and it's reactive so once anything reactive available in a test tube or in a lab it will definitely play a role whether any kind of neutralization or acidification any kind of role it will have you can't ignore it if it is passive then you can ignore but it is very reactive what we have seen ever since so the first slide if you see that is so if you see this is global distribution of calcium in dust and this is the region africa india and china this belt basically is having a lot of dust and see the contrast with other global distribution sites or geographical location you don't have dust and these are the places where you have lot of acid rain lot of industry acidify developed country so that zone basically is not having any kind of dust but we have lot of dust in this so this is first proof that our atmosphere is totally different any kind of set set of policy set of reactions will not work when you talk about indian atmospheric composition change you have to consider you have you can't ignore dust why it's a difficult to include because most of models most of policies they are framed for developed nation there you don't have dust why it was required because after indoax 
the focus of global focus became on india indian region south asia there all model practically they fail to predict any constituent whether it is so2 no2 p3 any just because of dust because those models they were not having dust as component in that later on many model they started using dust and prediction became better it still lot of things are not known about us but little bit we have contributed you know i was since there are a project called rains uh, asia you might have heard in that project you know it was predicted that india will have acid rain by 2010 and we were working on acid rain and we based on our result a very high calcium we predicted nothing there is no threat of acid rain in our publication and 2010 is gone now it was in 18 so from that angle it i was also part of window x we saw contrast of dust over indian subcontinent and over indian ocean so from there lot of dust chemistry and that kind of thing we did so this is first thing now uh, can i have water then if you look at this normal distribution of pm 2.5 in uh, delhi ipo site in 2013 if you look at this all major pollutant no2 co ozone pm 2.5 so2 if the red one is the limit given so except pm 2.5 all are below the red line basically so what is the problem only particulate matter is the problem gas cs pollution is not the problem from this slide if you see the top 10 location for pm 10 they all fall in northern india basically punjab up haryana and uh, if you look at this our study basically uh, where we have very high loading versus very low loading of uh, spm so if you see all these very high loading they are north north india side basically and low loading south india side. so clear cut there is a gradient of north versus south so as you see here there is a gradient here also there is a difference so uh, northern india versus south india this is a fact that we have lot of dust in northern india so the chemistry consequences everything in northern india will be different this slide basically is just to tell you briefly what is dust doing role of dust dust is basically if you see in general what we are inhaling lot of pollution i have calculated the in terms of this if you look at these these values we are inhaling the so much microgram of co so to on the on an average based uh, based on 36 meter cube air per day one adult in healing so dust is first thing is health hazard it's doing air pollution for human health then air pollution for plant health we did lot of study in delhi if you look at this dust is clogging the stomata it's a rupturing epidermis so based on this biochemical properties of plant they are changing like chlorophyll content sugar and these all these things so this is also one of the consequences of dust fall deposition then dust for climate if you see the dust at the at upper atmospheric dust is cooling the earth surface whereas dust in the lower surface with carbon urban area especially it has carbon so it's a warming in nature so this uh, is the corrode also you know for example taj mahal and that uh, moisture availability so taj mahal marble is getting deteriorated because of that another one is a very good scavenger of sulfur dioxide so in india we have naturally 
scavenging mechanism controlled by dust calcium carbonate and then sulfur dioxide with uh, presence of moisture it makes calcium sulfate which is not normally reported or done in acid by region so this is very very unique feature of indian atmosphere so dust is doing very positive role is it protects us from acid rain otherwise india would have been acidified it, this is just positive point of dust is a boon for us if you control dust 100% we will lead to acid acid rain will be common my god so whether you want dust or acid rain we have to go to one now coming to next this is what are the sources and composition of dust so mostly dust all dust the we have you know i have categorized dust into three categories one is soil dust desert dust which is normally calcium carbonate silica and it's a coming from local suspension of soil and land use land cover changes uh, and some of that is long range transport from middle east then second one is respite um, it's a resuspended road dust so this is having lot of mixed uh, metal and organic that is harmful for health third one is coming from <laughs> um, this construction dust from building sector basically we have this is rich in cement so typically we have analyzed dust is the composition of dust is having silicate aluminate and then calcium uh, calcite uh, sort of thing what i told clear cut dust is so much dominated by calcium if you see this bar this is such suspended particulate matter chemical analysis uh, this delhi and indian ocean so clear cut there is a difference of this component it has lot of calcium so calcium will act accordingly uh, this slide shows it has lot of carbon because uh, there are activities and dust gets uh, carbon on as a mixture so it's a calcium plus carbon particles in the uh, especially in urban air this is something contrast i want to show you consequence of dust basically if you have a um, lot of dust then uh, if you don't have dust then the ph of rain water matches with the free acidity of sulfate so in countries like sweden and us if you see here there is a very clear cut trend if you have very high uh, sulfate then you have very high uh, hydrogen from that angle very low ph but in india even at high sulfate level you have very high ph which is in contradiction with normal chemistry if very high sulfate assume that it sulfuric acid then ph will not be very high so that is another proof that indian atmosphere is behaving something very different and that should be taken care of for all kind of policies and also modeling purpose now another but very important issue for our region is uh, long range transport and transport pollution last uh, winter probably everybody knows that uh crop burning issue that by transport pollution and uh, not only that we have lot of dust coming from oman and mid other middle east part and uh, that dust makes you know refilling it's a reeling fishing it's a unending process basically so you can't control it it's coming so so that's what we are not able to control air pollution because much of that is contributing to all kind of particles you you might have seen people say it's a coarse particle no it's it's having fine particles also you might have seen uh, that holes and the tasveer tasveer ke piche bhi you know inside that dust so anybody knows that um, if you go by physics that dust is not entered by you know sedimentation diffusion impaction all these processes if you see 
based on that that is through diffusion matlab it's a so fine particle in the rain it enters so a small range even less than 1 micromet particle they have they contribute to the dust so from that angle we have to see that whether it is transported or local origin we have to fraction we have to differentiate and also we have to quantify how much it is contributed by local sources and how much it is contributed by long range transport it's a we have done lot of history about this you can see other one if you look at this this was the crop residue burning and another issue of uh, brick kiln lot of uh, we have Uh, brick making uh, factories and uh, that is called eat ka batta that eat ka batta is the big problem for in, uh, in delhi is air pollution that is basically uh, we have to control that but basically that is not a, uh, uh, under delhi government basically we have to have kind of interstate some body which can look after that next uh, is major features of air pollution this i have summarized what are the problems basically so as a, i mentioned that we have problem of transboundary pollution we did one study uh, last year around uh, gandhi jayanti dashera and uh, eid or muharram that just to see if nobody moves like gandhi jayanti then festival happens and then normal day from that angle i quantified these figures basically so it's a uh, almost uh, six the uh, 58% pollution is daily inside daily and 42% is transported out of that if you see even if you don't have any activity close everything we have 27% contribution from domestic sources and local wind wind hawa to chalegi and particle odenge so from that what if you open normal day in the sea and vehicular traffic that become another 31% contribution and this is very realistic i saw different data set and then so this we can't avoid you know even if you don't do any kind of 42% will be contributed air pollution this is fine particle not the dust air pollution will be contributed by transboundary effect the, which you don't have control aapke hath mein nahi hai that this is this is now that we call as this is not just dust this is air pollution it's not dust so that's why i have mentioned air pollution this is one feature we have second part is as i mentioned all gases pollutants basically they are below the limits but particulate matter is very high now when it comes to particulate matter we have to see kaha it's from where it is coming the sources of particulate matter basically are land use and land cover change urbanization process then unpaved roads what we have we have local desert also thar desert and then middle east africa long range transport this is these are the sources for dust high particulate matter i am not including you know gas to particle conversion that is not you know contributing to that is another chemistry then what to do you know before that i just want to highlight another issue related to that the air pollution controversy the issue of quality control and quality assurance in the data set everybody is saying something this figure and that figure because from sampling to analysis to data there is no standard protocol जिसके मन में जैसी आ रही है उसी तरह से करके एंड देन इट बिकम्स ए मैटर ऑफ डिस्प्यूट मैटर ऑफ डिस्प्यूट बेसिकली 
it's a it gives more chance to industry or the culprits to escape basically so from that angle we have to see how to uh, increase the data quality and what protocols what we should assign for that what i see there is a uh, very severe interagency contradiction uh, especially i will give example of uh, that uh, you might have seen air quality index air quality index ministry of earth science is having five districts you know green to red and ministry of environment is having six districts from green to red so what to follow for public when means we should have only one in this kind of classification category chart that should be given to public then also there is a coordination lack basically interagency that is also basically and also who will lead this air pollution climate that kind of so leadership issue in uh, public sector is there so this and now coming to how to control it before that we should know how dust can be removed how dust can be reduced so i have given these four options basically one is natural dry deposition settling by gravity and other means second one is scavenging through rain or by sprinkling so today it happened basically then you have to put some mechanical device for example esp or something and then it can be removed and other very important one is you make all surface bed jo unpaved road hai open soil dust hai that you so make it wet and then there won't be resuspension it will be minimum resuspension of dust when you drive or you know so from that angle now what to do This, this is i will discuss later but main features i will tell you the top priority is to have artificial lakes in india at least two lakes one on the border of haryana and other one on the border of up that side why i am suggesting because this is very very important as i mentioned in previous slide how to remove it dust is it's a, you know very locally also also it's a transported one so any mechanical device cannot work because of area what you need to you have to have kind of very any mechanism very similar to natural you know like rain scavenging for that you require very huge water bodies which can make clouds and afternoon we should have rain and then recirculated surface also become wet so we have to rejuvenate these water bodies whatever we have and also we have to have like usman sagar in hyderabad once usman sagar and himayat sagar they were created after that hyderabad weather became very pleasant every afternoon people used to have rain now there is no water in the those bodies less water so again after afternoon rain is stopped but what we need in delhi basically we don't have proper water in river even the vodka lake is dried up so if really we want to solve the problem we should have artificial lake big big huge lakes then you have evaporation of water and then and these are other options basically uh, what how much time i have oh, uh, yeah this is last just i guess so there are other category of uh, options what we have related to research in that if you look at that we should have a very uniform protocol for sampling analysis in that thing other options are policy oriented efforts we have to have uh, um, 
first is to control the dust coming out from building sector then if i want to go we can discuss later what what is where uh, one point very important is make uh, uh, the work from home scheme compulsory basically that is very good because when you commit less you emit less from vehicle you emit less from road and also you uh, at the source of electricity you use less electricity as if or whatever so many things so from work from home basically will have um, then inter agency task force and there are green belt and other green many things are there i don't want these are very general but very spe spe uh, specific but general basically i have one one by one we, we we can go there are lot of things to discuss under one particular point so with this i thank you very much we will discuss it later thank you thank you very much for course so thank you for both the information as well as the ideas of what to do about it as you said there's lots of uh, scope for discussion may i request um, maybe we can just move over oh, dr shukla yeah, um, so you could just make this bit over there and then we'll move to the front afterwards please while she's setting up Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I thank the uh, Center for Policy Research for inviting me for this. The topic on which I am going to talk today is road dust. <coughs> so, first question which comes to our mind is, what is road dust? So, road dust is non-exhaust portion which is. Uh, produced by mechanical dis uh, disintegration of materials of the vehicle wear and tear of the tires brakes then we uh, disintegration of material of pavement or the materials on the pavement so and then road dust also includes reentrainment or resuspension of materials produced earlier and that have deposited on the road or its vi uh, vicinity so as professor kulsheshra discussed road dust is a complex material composed of both mineralogical and chemical components including heavy metals metalloids minerals microplastics it depends like here in urban environment it has rained so what happens air pollution is there in the atmosphere it is washed off and it goes into the so we did a study with the university of birmingham and we found that like composition of the uh, this heavy material uh, heavy metals in the atmosphere in the air was similar to road runoff after the rain roadside water we collected and these heavy metals are very harmful so that's how and then it goes to the river contaminates if your yamuna side if you buy those uh, what palak and all those vegetables they are highly cont uh, contaminated with heavy metals so that's how it goes into the system so this shows like 80% of the road dust is forms is between pa uh, particulate matter pm10 that is equal to or less than 10 microns and pm2.5 that is equal to or less than pm uh, 2.5 microns and some recent studies have shown that 
very fine nano particles or ultra fine, uh, fine particles are produced uh, with uh, because of brake and tire wear, uh, tire wear. So this shows material flows of road dust particle with the main factors affecting the sword strengths like pavement characteristics, traffic intensity, speed, fleet composition and proximity to the traffic light. You'll ask why proximity to the traffic light or near the intersection. What happens? You keep on braking, then starting all that. That helps in uh, wearing of the pavement because of the interaction between the tire and the pavement. Then metallurgical condition, as Professor Kulshreshta said, that Delhi like th uh, is near Thar Desert. Ours is a arid uh, climate, so all that dust is blown off. Then season in summer, road dust is more because of the wind; it is blown off. Then presence of other external sources. So, what is the contribution of roadside dust to the air pollution in NCR? First study we did was for Autofuel Policy Committee, which CRRI did, was uh, uh, in 2001. And in that, we did some source apportionment, and we found that PM10 was near the uh, near cannot place 38 percent. And this study showed that like PM10 or SPM suspended particulate matter was from 30 to 40 percent. And then like we did after that, around 2002 to 2005, we did real-time uh, real characterization of fine particulate, uh, uh, particulates at roadside environment in Delhi. And we observed that PM10 decreased with the distance from the road. As you move away from the road, PM10 or road dust decreases. And during congestion, it showed significant increase. Then metallurgical conditions we observed were uh, also have significant effect on the level of PM10 and 2.5. Then we uh, plotted during that time only 2002 to 2004 SPM suspended particulate pollution intensity profiles for Delhi, taking the data of the CPCB. So this shows from 2 to 10 p.m. This is like dark portion is concentration like as you can see is more of the suspended particulate matter. Whereas during the night, it is less. Then again, it increases from 6 to 2 p.m. Uh, it's a total suspended particulate matter. Uh, pardon? Yes. It includes all. Huh. Previously, when we were doing auto fuel policy study, that time, like, only SPM was measured and PM10. Then slowly, like, around 2004, I think, uh, respirable particulate matter. And 2008, I think, the study uh, formulated those standards for 2.5. Uh, 2009, yes. So then another study uh, was carried out by CPCB and NIRI, our sister laboratory, in 2008. And it showed that dust, road dust forms 52.5% of the total particulate matter, that is PM10. Then a, a recent study in 2015-16 by IIT Kanpur, it showed that road dust makes up around 56% of total PM10 particles and about 38 percent of PM 2.5 particles and they are the most dominant pollutants in Delhi air. As Professor uh, Kulshishta also said that particulate matter is a dominant source of pollution in Delhi and IT re uh, report also emphasized that silt load on some Delhi roads is very high and silt becomes airborne with the movement of the vehicles it, because of turbulence it gets resuspended. And PM10 emissions from road dust was over 65 tons per day in Delhi, they estimated. So what, is the, what are the reasons for road dust uh, in Delhi? One is constant vehicular movement. You know, Del like if you add some, uh, uh, the vehicles of Calcutta, Chennai, and uh, this Bombay, you will find that Total number of vehicles in Delhi are some of these three cities. So, so many number of vehicles are there. They are moving so constantly on the roads. Reentrainment dust is very high because of that. Then driving pattern. 
like if you are a guy, uh, aggressive driver or you can't uh, constantly stop and go and stop and go that also because of tire friction emission of the apart from the exhaust emission which i am not talking road dust emissions are more then quality of road surface and maintenance i think you must be observing what is the quality that also contributes then like water logging what happens because of water logging bitumen and aggregates they separate so our roads they deteriorate very fast in october when sun is there then again when it dries road dust when you are walking uh, like driving on the road road dust becomes like it uh, it increases then construction debris then garbage like our roads are every, nobody's baby everybody wants to put garbage there shopkeepers they clean their shops put the garbage on the road people what they do they clean their house they put the garbage dust everything on the road, uh, street so i mean like as you can see here in this photograph you can see our shoulders road uh, median and shoulders they are uh, open potholes deterioration of the roads all these factors they contribute to road dust so controlling road dust emissions these are the four basic ways how we can control the road dust first is at the source controlling at the source creation or present like limit the creation or presence of road dust sized particles reduce wind speed at the ground level like barriers or breakers are there then bind dust particles like as he said with water you can dust uh, bind the dust particles or there are stabilizers chemical stabilizers are there if unpaved road is there you can put those stabilizers like calcium and other chemicals there are many dust suppressants chemical dust suppressants will which will bind the soil together and it will not get resuspended then capture and remove uh, remove the dust from its source so particle traps and other things so what can be done these are like binding of dust as i said with hydroscopic solution is one of the effective short term methods and other reducing traffic speed and volume and other but before i discuss this i want to discuss are the action proposed in the national clean air program or graded uh, action program are sufficient or adequate they are like it is like a patient is there he is having a chronic uh, infection and doctor gives just paracetamol that okay whenever you have high temperature just reduce it they don't treat systematic uh, like systematic treatment is not being done these are like that so they are not that's why all these are piece meal or like knee jerk reaction we do like here buying those expensive these uh, vacuum cleaners they can't be used in colonies uneven road surface you can't use them broken pavement excess waste lying on the roads like odd and even so those one knee jerk reactions are not going to help uh yes yes i'm going to show that also so the quality first how to improve that like quality of road surface and we go step by systematic we have to control it in a systematic manner first we see the source so quality of road surface and maintenance should be taken care of smart road construction techniques still we are using very old outdated road construction techniques and equipments so we have to need there are many like crri doing uh, is doing lots of research on polymer uh, polymeric roads and like cold mix technologies and warm mix technologies which can be easily utilized so that binder doesn't separate from the aggregate our pavements don't break then like proper design and codes landscaping shoulders yes as you uh, can see here this is in vip area lok kalyan mark it is very nicely it is in delhi only and that is also in delhi only so you can see the contrast we can do things but we are not doing because people are scared they like here they are implementing those things so then stabilizing agents and then like wall to wall paving is very important with pro uh, proper drainage i mean when i'm i'm staying in sarita vihar and when you come towards mathura road you can see that there is 
uh, below the uh, flyover there is no drainage i don't know pwd or mcd who constructed that road so little rain is there it will get clogged that is another problem so i mean like there should be some kind of deterrent accountability i can see lots of young faces so i think you should think of something out of box and start thinking in those, these terms this is very important everything like all the rules laws everything is there but there is no enforcement so there should be some kind of proper enforcement then collection we come to collection and disposal of roadside garbage dust leaves we don't have solid waste management here in delhi it is totally failed everybody wants to put so there should be proper guidelines for that and implementation and enforcement heavy fines should be there if somebody puts you go to singapore if you drop a paper you'll have to pay some 500 singapore dollars here nobody bothers everybody wants to put your traveling in uh, mercedes and you put wrappers and everything from the cars which is really bad then like construction debris there are no rules there are rules government has said but then they are not implemented while coming here i saw at jangpura they are constructing the bridge all the debris was on the road then vehicle movement as he said like public transportation there i can go and on like public transportation there should be integrated like if you want to wean away public uh, people from cars or private vehicles to the public transport you should have easily accessible and attractive public transport so that people should go and travel and it should be integrated route rationalization it should be there then rationalization of fare should be there metro fares are very high buses it is low so on same route if both are going i'll go by bus why i'll go by metro their last mile and first mile connectivity should be there so all these it's need a coordinated plan for that then like transport management measures if you want to reduce the number of vehicles on the roads reducing traffic speed and volume so that like turbulence and as i said uh, speed at ground level the wind speed can be broken off so we need a very systematic approach multi pronged holistic coordinated and strict enforcement carrot and stick policy like people should be rewarded like if some zone or some area is doing very well they should be rewarded rewarded and people should be punished or those who are responsible they should be punished so for effective policy a system approach where synergies will have to be built between several agencies would have to integrate the efforts of urban planning transport public health urban local bodies among other agencies like only cpcd mcd they can't do even civic like even people they they should be aware civic agencies are they should be involved and with it would require a, ma a massive public awareness and citizen uh, partnership so we have to realize because this dust is very very harmful for our health once we inhale the bigger particles they get deposited in our nose finer particles they go inside our respiratory system one micron or less than they go in our uh, this deep inside alveoli in the lungs and they cause lots of copd like chronic obstructive uh, disorders respiratory problems and we don't realize it actually because air pollution dust they have synergistic impact and i can tell you for the last more than 30 years i have been given giving lectures on health and air pollution i never realized last year i was just panting i thought okay i'll go to the doctor and what he told me emphysema which is because of dust and my 25% lungs were gone because of dust and this dust pollution so it's a reality and so many people are suffering we don't realize and we should start thinking about it and for our future generation and like i think you people should think something out of box and start taking proactive measures so thank you thanks thanks, thanks very much uh, dr shukla i hope we can do justice to your uh, your your sort of call for action in the in the discussion and 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 after that uh, let me turn to um, uh, mr agarwal to give a little bit of uh, an introduction 
speaking from the point of view of the of the construction industry in particular and then we'll have some discussion after that and and may i just request you all to move around to the front for the discussion if that's okay Okay. Um, first of all, thank you, CPR, for inviting. Um, let me uh, tell you something. When I was a young professional, the first company or the first organization I worked for, there was a very senior, learned professor from CPR who came and spoke to us, Ashish Nandi. So, you know, it was a very haloed institution, still is. And you know, uh, me coming to CPR and trying to speak to CPR is quite a quite an honor. And I think, um, so thanks, thanks, Partha, thanks, uh, Professor Navroz, for inviting me here. Um, I speak on behalf of the industry. So, you know, first of all, industry is supposed to be the culprit for everything. So, you know, while all this is happening and real estate and construction, you know, uh, the, the image that we carry as an industry is that, you know, we are perpetrators of all kinds of crimes that exist. So, you know, that is one thing that um, a lot of people, you know, understand. But let me give you a slightly... Uh, perspective of what we face in the industry and how we kind of, you know, work and live by the day. Um, so I was speaking to, you know, uh, just before this, um, that as an industry, we are pretty immune to any law, anything that comes on our head because we already have some 49 to 50 permissions before we actually can go and dig a hole in the ground. So that is the kind of environment we operate in. So if one dust is another one, it's another one, right? So, you know, for us, uh, because we are like a milch cow for everybody, you know, the farmer tries to extract two more dollars from us and, you know, poor farmers. Then you go to the politician, he tries to his, you know, uh, two bits of tricks of, you know, trying to say, this is what I will do if you do this for me. Uh, then there is this whole, uh, you know, set of environmental lobby, which is now, you know, come on your head. Then there is this whole finance lobby, you know, uh, bankers are, I was one, uh, probably one of the most corrupt breeds that exists in this country, up, across the globe, rather. Uh, but, you know, uh, we have to be very financially, you know, savvy. So, you know, there are so many married number of regulations and married number of things that come to us. Uh, if you really want the industry to really do something, uh, and Navroz was, you know, very uh, very happy that, you know, what can you positively do for the industry to incent us to do something? So, you know, if you uh, have a situation where there is another regulation that comes in and one has to then strictly enforce it. That is one way. Obviously, now RERA has come, and I think a lot of you may not know, but RERA, RERA is called the Real Estate Regulation Act, which is now defined some norms which says that the money that you're taking for project, for the sales that you're doing for, uh, in a particular project, a certain amount is reserved in a bank as an escrow, which is to be used for its construction. Very good law. I think that is what is required. Then, obviously, there's a lot of, you know, fine print, which also says that a lot of this responsibility is left to the developer. However, there's an audit, which is, you know, six-monthly audit or whatever, and then, therefore, the industry will fall in line because the competitor, the, 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 your customer is going to drive you to do these things. So, I think the first thing is that as an industry participant, I'm equally concerned about dust. You know, um, you saw me cough a couple of times because the guy next door is constructing his house where I live. And I had to really force him to actually put those curtains and sheets. So I think there is a general level of apathy when people start constructing as developers, as even building material suppliers, that there is a certain amount of, you know, externality you produce when you develop. So while, you know, one can say that as a developer, you know, we do a lot of good things, we provide shelter, we provide built environment, you know, all of us should be thankful for that. But I think we're also, in one sense, you know, you know, I remember that I was trying to do one feasibility study long time back, and there was this pristine land in Unnao district, and therefore the idea was to actually create a very large industrial township next to Kanpur to revive Kanpur. And we were driving, and then, you know, somebody, you know, and we're all urban planners, we said, all what we are going to do is end up destroying a lot of this green field because you are going to do such a lot of damage when you're going to make roads, you're putting industry. So is this fertile land really meant for, you know, putting this industry? And I think that's a question we just kind of remember. So I think a lot of um, industry will be willing to take these positive measures if you positively incent. And I think while we'll take this discussion forward, uh, the the incentives which typically industry asks for are like, you know, give me a tax incentive because I am complying, therefore, I must be given some incentive. Now, that may be good for a while, and therefore, you know, one can say 
that there is a certain amount of environmental pollution, there is some kind of measures if I take, I'm incented. But I don't think so we have the liberty of, you know, getting this extension for a longish period of time. So it can exist for a couple of years and, you, you know, you incent people to sort of spray the site with water. Again, the question is, do we have so much of water? So one thing is that, you know, as a construction industry, I was developing a township in uh, Gurgaon, 75 acres of group housing, and we needed lots of water to do the construction. We were not allowed to do any boreholes. We were supposed to go and get this water from the STP, and we were to supply. We were supplied some 40 tankers of water a day. Now, what happens to my commitment for the sales that I have done? Can I really construct a 75-acre site with maybe 5,000 houses in that kind of you know water? The answer is absolutely no. And therefore, you know, some kind of urban planning also needs to happen where you allow construction to happen at sites which are essentially not fit for that kind of a development. And, you know, you, you're trying to now say that all the development money that has gone into this Yamna belt in, in Noida, I think everybody is familiar with this NGT ruling, the land has been sold by whom? The Noida Authority, right? So it's not, you know, usurped. It is not, the developers have not, you know, kind of gone and squatted on the land. You've paid your full installment. You've done all the construction. Now somebody wakes up and says, sorry, this is not a development zone. This can't happen. You know, you have to be very sure. And... In Noida, if I remember, there is a biodiversity park. So next to the, you know, Yamna embankment, there is this 100-acre biodiversity park, and the city was supposed to be beyond that. At some stage, you know, there was a government option. So where you have the GIP mall and we have all the other construction going on, it's actually part of the biodiversity park. So A, I mean, there is a planning, and planning is always in the retrospective. So I think there is this whole industry which is very willing to comply, uh, you know, uh, tax could be one measure. The other measure could be that you are giving a little more FSI, maybe include it as part of their, you know, CSR initiative. Uh, and good developers, believe you me, uh, who will adopt these environmentally healthy practices, whether it is dust, whether it is making sure that your construction site looks clean, they, they are going to have market edge. I remember there was a site, you go as a customer, you see a site which is filthy, you see a site which has all kinds of, you know, debris lying over. And you have another site which has all the things which are cleanly, you know, stashed up in a corner. And that is a site that you probably will, you know, end up buying because the market is going to respect the fact that if you are being so cautious about your site, you're being cautious about the way you manage the site, I think you're going to deliver a better or a superior product. And that is something which you will see that more and more there will be these conscientious developers uh, who will do better stuff and there will be others who will probably not be as conscientious and will break all the rules and there will be a price difference that the market will see. You go and now see and do a survey in wherever you come from. If there is a developer who is known for good quality, you can go his site will be much more organized and he or she will command at least 1,500 rupees more than the market. So I think ultimately if you generate awareness among people, say that there is a certain amount of regulation that developers are supposed to follow. And if that developer is not following that regulation, you can just put this on the RERA website. Say that this developer is not behaving the way we have asked him to. And you will see the impact. You know, uh, the, the moment the industry feels that, you know, its product is not being sold because of bad publicity. And technology is great. I mean, all what you have to do now is there is no reference check. I remember, you know, one of these tenders that were being launched, you know, the, the, the gentleman who was the head of that uh, authority said, I'm not going to verify anything. All what I'm going to do is whatever you have given me as your credentials, I'm going to put this on the website. The moment I put this on the website and you are lying and you are not really presenting the truth, I'll come to know. So similarly, I think there is, there needs to be, like for example, there is this re uh, real estate regulation authority in every state. There are a lot of, there is a lot of information which is there on the website. So today, I think in the next two, three years, you will have a situation where there will be no information asymmetry. I mean, there are lots of places where already RERA is implemented. And in Mumbai, you know, the idea was that developers always said that, well, it's very scarce to get a property here and we are doing fine and they would not drop the prices. The moment RERA data has come on the website, you know that is all sham because there is a lot of inventory that is all piled up. And you see the prices have softened. I mean, Bombay Standard's price is softening really is, is, a, is a very different, uh, you know, connotation. But the fact is that if you have these measures where you 
incent the industry by maybe giving some bit of tax breaks or some bit of you know, uh, you know liberal FAR or you know norms is good, but it can't continue indefinitely. I think we owe it to our children, as ma'am, you know, you put it very, very you know uh, uh, clearly. But I think environment and you know our health is is so important. You owe it to your children. You owe it to your future generations. So as an industry, we are very happy that you know this kind of consciousness has happened. It will ha it will have to be the leaders of the industry who will try and sort of make the way for the others. But you know, a uh, bit little more of uh, communication, little more of awareness, little more of you know making sure that the developers are also find and impacted if they, their site is not clean. I mean, I know for a fact that today we don't even have in this country something called building inspection. You know, you know, I come from RICS and you go and see what is it that uh, people do. There is something called a building inspector. You know, and, and when you come uh, and teach, so I was trying to build a curriculum and somebody said, you don't have this thing called building inspection. I said, I don't even know what that means. Because there is a lack of awareness that during the construction, there has to be a building inspector who has to come and see how have you not only done your structures and your other plumbing and pipe, but there is a huge amount of site safety security, which also goes in. And I know that there are regulations in Hong Kong in, you know, couple of, and these are not astronomically complicated things. These are very simple things. If you have dug up earth, have you got a, you know, gunny bag or some kind of a hessian cloth to cover that. Have you sprinkled, you know, water over it so the dust doesn't go? Are you trying to, you know, make sure that all the pathway is clean? Are you covering your debris? Are you making sure that it is removed regularly and it is dumped to a site which is a landfill site? So these are all good practices, best practices. And I think if there is a small regulation that's put in, not cumbersome. I mean, the moment you have a law which says don't dig from this earth, you can't have a borewell, and you need all the water and all water can supply you is only 40 tankers, people will do something or the other. Because people will make sure that they will construct. If you've made sure that they are on a parcel which is approved for habitation, so these kind of laws, I think, also need to be looked into. I mean, today we have a density norm in Gurgaon which is so low. You can build, I think, 40 or 50 houses a square foot and you have a FSI 1.75. The, the apartment that one can construct average is about 1700 square feet now we are living in you know 2018 the prices in gurgaon are at least six seven eight ten thousand rupees a foot so what are you saying that is in this country next to the ncr which is supposed to be a good suburb only people who have at least a crore and above can only buy a house is that a rational law and that's something which also we need to understand that you know by making these utopian norms Things don't really, you know, uh, necessarily, I mean, one can blame that, you know, Noida is a poor cousin and Mayavati did this and that. But only thing that I can say is that Noida today is a location where you still have affordable housing. And it's a different issue than crib and cry. But yes, today the density norm cannot be 40 houses an acre. It's criminal to have that kind of a norm. And while you go to south, there is just no density restriction. You can build as many houses per acre as you can. I think that also needs to be plugged in at some stage. You can't just say that if you're in Bangalore or you're in Chennai, I've seen houses in Bombay where they talk of FSI of six or seven, and they're putting some 400 houses an acre. I mean, that's the other you know side. So somebody needs to look into rationalization of norms. Somebody needs to look into some kind of a self-regulation mechanism, positively incent you know, the developers in the construction industry to behave. When I saw this picture of a road which is beautifully constructed and the and the whole kind of, and, and, and the berms not being done and the debris lying in some half completed column on the way, see the see the site has its eyesore. I don't know why do we give completion certificates and pass the bills of people who have not done the cleaning of the road. I mean, as a private you know developer, there was one regulation we had at least that you know it's also very very wasteful if you're putting another brick or your sand is coming from the, you know, uh, in, in a truck where half the sand is, you know, gone, the guy will charge you for what he is loaded at the site when it reaches your site. You know, if that material is gone, it is not stacked properly. It is, you know, left to uh, some kind of a corrosion and, you know, so this is all losses. And I think 
at least as a private uh, you know engager we've always told our contractors if you don't please keep the site clean and if you don't make sure that the debris is collected at one place we are not going to clear your bills and you we divided the work so the foundation guy came in we said the same contractor is not going to do the superstructure because this guy has to go out of the site make sure that he leaves the site clean for the next guy to come in and then kind of do the work so it's it's all not rocket science is very very simple guidelines which one can formulate floated to the industry and industry at least a 30% of that industry i'm not talking of 70% but a 30% of industry is really really feeling that if we don't you know behave as conscientious developers we will stop selling so if a dlf has to you know big a brand and sell those expensive apartments they need to actually do some groundwork if ats today that's a big developer in rwanda has to command a premium of 1000 rupees their sites and their product needs to look much more better and they will be the first ones and then obviously in competition there will be others who follow i think this is a simple thing but i think it sounds very simple difficult to implement always there is this situation so happy to take up questions thank you